Janice Mitchell, Pelvic Health Physical Therapist. And we are going live today with the OBGYN mum. So I'm super excited. Hello, friends. She will be joining us soon. Good morning or good evening, based on where you are in the world. Okay, hello, I see she joined, and we're gonna go live. We are connecting now. There we are. Hi, Brooke. Hello. Oh, she woke up. She obviously woke up. The one time she wasn't supposed to, she's here. So we'll see how we go. That's fine. That's fine. What is her name? This is Lila. Well, I'll try to distract some snacks. So we'll see if that yes, works. Okay. Great. So I'm going to adjust my camera just a little bit here. All right, so I'm so happy that you are joining us and are willing to share your experience and expertise. And I'm sorry I got the uh, interview time, the daylight savings time mixed up. And I'm glad you caught it. Was it was very confusing. <laughs> Crazy. So, yeah. um, so for anyone that's joining us that may not know who I am or who Brooke is, I'll give you just a little bit about myself. I'm a pelvic health physical therapist. And Brooke, tell us a little bit about yourself. Uh, I'm an obstetrician and gynecology doctor, um, and I work in London. So my experience might be a little bit different from what um, if some of your followers are based in the US, but I try to give advice that's kind of as general as possible as well. Exactly, good. And just kind of a disclaimer, everyone that may be listening, we want you to always check with your provider and with your hospital and birth center and make sure that, you know, um, the information that we're giving is general information, but not intended to be specific medical advice for for anyone. So, thank you so All much. All right, for so let's. That. Yeah. <laughs> I thought it might be helpful for us to just review a little bit of the anatomy just briefly before we jump into the questions. So I have a pelvis. <laughs> and Fantastic. so anyone that's watching, we have the pubic bone here in the front. And then we turn around and there's the tailbone, okay? And the pelvic floor muscles attach from the pubic bone, stretch back to the tailbone. And then we have three openings. So we have, this is the urethra for urine. Here's the vaginal canal. And then here's the anus. And so this is the perineal body. And this is what uh, most of what we're gonna be talking about today is, is involving. So if there's a tear, this is generally where it's going to tear, but you know, I, there are some other types of tears. And if there's an episiotomy, then that's generally what um, is, well, it is what's cut. So, yeah. All right. Good. Anything else you think we need to share from an anatomy standpoint, just as a baseline? No, I think that's great. We can add in anything as we need it. <laughs> okay. With your handy model. Yes, we have the model. <laughs> All right. So let's just jump in here. We, oh, by the way, everybody, thank you for your questions. <laughs> There was an amazing amount of questions, so we're going to try to get to everything. If we don't answer everything, we will in the future, either via story or another interview. So, all right, instrumental. So what types of instruments are there and why would you pick one versus? Okay, so we use two main types of instruments, um, forceps or Vontus or Kiwi cup. It's the same thing. It's basically a suction cup. Okay. Um, so what's really important, I guess, to start with the basics as to kind of why we do an instrumental delivery and what decisions we're making. Uh, we, we think about doing an instrumental delivery when a woman is fully dilated. So she's reached 10 centimeters. So she's quite far along in her labor. And then usually it's for one of two reasons. So either she's been pushing for a long time and we think just she's exhausted. And just to kind of help in that final bit, we can use an instrument to help deliver the baby or if there's signs that the baby's in distress. So the baby, usually it's on the heart trace, the CTG. And if we see something there that we're worried about, um, and we basically just need this baby delivered quicker, um, then we'll use an instrument. And so we have the choice of the two instruments that I mentioned, the instrumental, um, sorry, the forceps or the Von Tuss cup. And um, we decide that based on exactly the position of the baby's head. So it's really important to know, you know, whether the baby's head is coming down in exactly the right position already. So we just need to lift it straight out or if it's gonna need to be rotated a little bit, how high up it is, that sort of thing. Um, and also how well mum is pushing. 
forceps require a little less maternal effort. You still need to push if you're having an instrumental birth. Um, but if mum is really so exhausted and can't push very well, sometimes that might be a reason we choose forceps good, over the suction good. cup. Okay, good. Very, very helpful. Great information. <laughs> uh, do you have a preferred instrument? Um, I think we should all be equally comfortable to use both. And that's why it is really about choosing the right instrument for the right situation and the right woman rather than uh, we've got a preferred instrument. I think generally forceps will be more guaranteed to, to deliver the baby um, in most situations because you don't need so much maternal effort, effort for the mum, I mean. But in general, if used in the right situation, either should work equally well. Okay, great. Good. And then how often do you uh, use instruments? So I would say, so in the UK, the statistics are about one in eight of all deliveries. So we say about 12% of births. Um, that, that rate is much lower for second time or third time mums. So, but that's, that's kind of in all births. Okay, great. At what point can you refuse? Okay, at what point can you refuse an instrument, uh, a vaginal delivery and have a C-section? So. Yeah, this I think this is the question we got when we first started talking, because you got asked this, didn't you, um, from women saying that they wish they'd said no to having having a forceps. Yeah. And I, I kind of responded to you saying, that's OK, uh, yeah. but you have to be sure about you understand what you're refusing and, and at the right point to do so. So um, it's. I think, of course, it's your body, it's your right to choose. Uh, and if you feel very strongly that you don't want an instrumental birth, that's, that's completely your right. Um, I've sort of explained the situations where we use them. Um, and I think it's important to consider, you know, where, where you are in your labor and make sure if you feel strongly that you don't want an instrumental birth, you say it as early as possible. Because there is sort of a point of no return whereby your baby's head is so low and it's about to come out, um, that really t to do a C-section is ah. dangerous because you kind of pull the, the baby's head back up yeah. um, through the vaginal canal, up back into the uterus because you deliver through the uterus if you're doing a C-section birth. So, and, and that can um, cause damage to the baby's skull and also to the maternal tissues as well. So it is dangerous um, to kind of convert when it's very, very last minute. Um, but sometimes it happens if, if an instrumental doesn't work as well. We do have to convert to C-sections, but we would rather avoid it when you're fully dilated and the head is low down wherever possible. So having a dialogue early with your provider yeah. and Absolutely. being informed and then ultimately you know, I think we talked about this too, like the safety of the baby and the mom are the most important. Right. Exactly. So we exactly. can have our preferred method of delivery, but ultimately we want you to be safe and the baby to be safe. And that's why we would be doing any of these, um, you know, these situations would only arise because we're either worried about mom or baby. Uh, so that's what's important to kind of bear in mind. But if you've got very strong beliefs and wishes about your body, just discuss them. Make sure you also know all the risks and all the information to make an informed decision yourself. Mm -hmm. Exactly. Good. Okay, so why would you sometimes go straight to a C-section? So they're, they're coming in and they're planning to have a vaginal delivery and something is what instances would cause you to go straight to Yes, yeah, so it, it, it definitely does happen because not everybody has an instrumental birth. Um, in, in general, so you've got quite a long way to go before you get to fully dilated. Uh, you know, you've got to get, go from when your cervix is closed and long um, to, to kind of when it's very short and then it, it dilates all the way up to 10 centimeters. And that can take some time and you've got lots of contractions happen in that time. And um, we're often monitoring the baby. It depends on your exact circumstances, you know, whether you have a CTG monitor or we're just listening in. In the UK, we do that. In birth centers we listen in rather than having continuous ctg monitoring um okay. sometimes in low risk women uh, but basically okay. if we're monitoring your baby and we are worried about something but you are not yet fully dilated that might be an indication that we would need to do a c-section because if we need to deliver your baby and you're not fully dilated we can't do an instrumental so the only thing to kind of get things get that baby delivered the only option is a c-section take it out so there's lots of reasons yeah so it might be because um you're not dilating quick enough. So we've given you a long period of time, having lots of contractions, maybe with the drip, the syntocin on drip, um, to try to get more contractions, but you're still not dilated up. So that might be a reason we go for a C-section or if we're worried about the baby or one of you's developed an infection, things like that. 
great. Um, okay, so if you're having an instrumental delivery, when is an episiotomy done? So when do you decide that an episiotomy is needed? Um, yes, so if you're having an instrumental delivery, in most situations, we do an episiotomy, and that's because the instrument itself, especially forceps, take up a bit of room in the vagina, and on top of that, you need the baby's head to come through. So to make a little bit more space, we'll often do an episiotomy, and the whole idea of an episiotomy is to create a little bit more room, because you're, you're dividing the tissues, um, to create a bit more space um, to reduce the risk of tearing. Um, and we know that um, for example, forceps does increase the risk of tearing. Um, so that is one way of kind of reducing that or, or ma making sure that it happens in a controlled way. Uh, we don't, uh, in the UK, I'm not sure about in the US, we don't always, always perform an episiotomy with um, a Vontus delivery, but that, that depends um, on kind of how much space they think that there is. Okay. So is it better to have an episiotomy or a natural tear? And can you choose? Um, again, you can always choose to say no to something if you feel very strongly that you don't want something. So yes, you could say no to having an episiotomy. Again, I would advise trying to discuss that as early as possible. So the person that's going to be delivering your baby is aware. Um, and yes, so even, even if we're not using instruments, sometimes we do an episiotomy anyway. And again, that's if we think there's, there's not that much space coming through and there's a risk that when you tear, that tear will extend. And we worry about that going into, into the anal sphincter and causing those sorts of injuries. So we do that to prevent that. But if you um, kind of would rather just see, see what happens and say, I don't want to have an episiotomy, you can um, say no to that, of course. So this question isn't on there, but it just kind of brought up. So. As a provider, you're monitoring everything and then you are discussing what's happening. And mm. so you'll talk to them and say, hey, I think you need an episiotomy. They don't just automatically do it. No, you, you shouldn't. Um, and, and often, you know, in an you ideal discuss scenario. pain relief as well. Yeah. So mm -hmm. in, in an I the problem is sometimes at this point in delivery, you know, it, it is an emergency situation. And that's why these things are good to discuss if you can earlier on, especially because if you feel that you would say no, um, you don't want them to just say, oh, I'm doing your episiotomy now as they're doing it. And then you say, no, don't. So you want to try and discuss it early if possible, uh, because most people probably assume you won't say no. They would assume that that's something you would just let them decide if they right. need to do it or not. Uh, so, yeah. I think discuss it early if possible. Discuss it early. Uh, but they do need your consent. But that might be sometimes, you know, oh, I'm, I'm going to do an episiotomy now. Okay. Uh, kind of assuming you'll say yes. Yeah. So I think it is. Yeah. We're trusting you. We're trusting you that you're going to make the best decision for us and our baby. Right. Yeah. So. Exactly. Okay. Good. Um, so is there a risk of an episiotomy scar tearing during the second birth? So that tissue is weakened and. Mm. Yeah, we do know that uh, subsequent births, um, if you've had an episiotomy before, you're quite likely to have an episiotomy again. Um, and that's again, to, because once there is scar tissue, I'm sure you know this probably better than I do, um, that that scar tissue can tear again. And so again, to, in order to reduce the risk of that kind of tearing in an uncontrolled way, whereby it might cause um, an injury to the anal sphincters, we may repeat the episiotomy, so cutting it in the same way. Let's briefly for... Um anyone that may not be informed there mm -hmm. are basically four grades of uh, ah, care ah. so i have a post that gives a pretty good visual of that you can scroll back a few weeks but basically grade four is the most severe and it's going mm -hmm. all the way into the anal sphincter uh, and that sphincter is what controls your rectum and your poop and so it it tears all the way in so you're trying to avoid it and when you have that tear, there can be a lot of other issues um, mm -hmm. in terms of function. So yeah. you're, you're trying to keep mom and baby safe, and mm -hmm. you're trying to avoid that third and fourth degree tear. Yeah. And an episiotomy would be a way to help avoid that. Yes, exactly. Mm -hmm. Good. Okay. Uh, is it better? Is it? I, can you tell us who is more likely to tear and how can you minimize it? So do you, do you have a body type that you see tears more likely or anything? I would say no, 
I would say there's not really any particular way of predicting. Um, if someone's kind of progressing very fast in their labor, that we may, we may be a bit worried that they'd be more likely to tear because we kind of expect that the baby would deliver quickly as well. But other than that, as you do the vaginal examination is when you can kind of make a, make a judgment as to whether you think that they're likely to tear or not. Mm -hmm. And then you shared something with me maybe last week that uh, I thought was very helpful. So what are some of the things that your, your hospital or, or that, um, that is an initiative to help mm. reduce third and fourth degree tears? Yeah, there's lots of kind of new ideas out there and some of the ideas that have been around a long time that are coming back into fashion. Uh, but one thing that we, we, we believe helps um, is to have, kind of have a hands-on approach to delivery rather than hands-off. Um, so wherever possible, kind of supporting the baby's head as the baby's coming out and somebody kind of helping to support your perineum as, the, as um, your baby's head is crowning, exactly. So that's kind of um, perineal support and a hands-on delivery delivery um that yeah so that that helps um an episiotomy performed at the right time in the right situation is helpful um and perineal massage as well is known to be to be good at, at supporting um to, to reducing your risk of tears as well mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. good so then in terms of perineal massage do you have um do you have providers at the hospital that do it or does in your scenario does someone need to bring a partner in and they're the designated perineal massage person so when we say perineal massage what i'm referring to actually is perineal massage done at home in the antenatal period okay so um so from around 35 weeks of pregnancy um that to, to sort of gen gently stretch um the perineal body yourself yeah, yeah. So we're massaging and stretching. Yeah, and then we're to preparing it about a centimetre into the vagina and kind of pulling um, down that way as well. Yeah. So that, that sort of, there, there's lots of videos on YouTube that can help yeah. you. And so doing that technique for about 10 minutes every day um, from around 35, 36 weeks of pregnancy can reduce the risk of perineal tears. So I'm not so familiar with doing perineal massage in labour. Um, itself we, we don't practice that regularly or have anyone okay. that practices that yeah okay good uh is it common to heal unevenly you probably again could probably advise on this better than me <laughs> yes you see, you see you see all kinds of variations and also think about think about let's let's come back here so we're taking let's say it's an episiotomy so mm -hmm. an episiotomy is going to go down but then usually to the side right because we're trying to avoid yeah we we, we don't cut vertically down in the uk we cut off yeah around yeah around like a 45 degree angle okay 45 mm -hmm. so we're there mm -hmm. um now if you tear you have much less control over mm -hmm. how you tear right so mm -hmm. an episiotomy it's a graded Yes, and the idea is it guides it away from the anus. Mm -hmm. uh, with a tear, it can be zigzag, it can be very asymmetrical. So, um, and then also depending on your tissue, when you're getting stitched up and how well it's supported afterwards, mm -hmm. there's many factors that can affect healing. So, yeah. so yes, it is, um, it is possible to heal unevenly, but I would just encourage you, you have this scar and we can do scar massage, do perineal massage after you're healed and at, generally after you're resumed to, uh, you're cleared to resume intercourse is when we would uh, suggest beginning perineal massage afterwards. Mm -hmm. Would you agree with that? Yeah, and just basically to see a pelvic, um, a women's health physiotherapist is just really important, I think, if you're worried about anything. <laughs> Good. Okay, so does a mid does a midwife helping to stretch during crowning cause a second degree? Well, I would say the opposite. So, um, as I say, kind of supporting the perineum and supporting the baby's head coming out is actually what really helps um, can help to reduce tearing. So, I don't think um, a midwife kind of depending on how they're stretching the perineum, but if kind of doing it in the, in the correct way, that shouldn't yeah. worsen tears. It, it should help. It should help. Supporting to create, to create space, more exactly. space and more exactly. tissue yeah. laxity, right? We're yes, to exactly. Tissue. Yeah. Okay. Do preventative measure, measures such as epi, no, or perineal massage work? Sorry, say that again. 
Yeah, you're fine. Do preventative measures such as the epi no. Well, just yeah. let's do one thing at a time. So yeah. epi no. Do you have any experience with that and uh, an opinion I, on it? No, I get asked that I don't actually know the stats on that particular device. I kind of talk more generally around perineal massage. Um, so the Epino is a tool that can be used to help with perineal massage, as I understand it. Um, yes. But I don't know about how the stats themselves, about how they reduce, they reduce uh, perineal tears. That's on, that's on my topic list. So we're doing some research and we'll have a topic com uh, okay, post coming excellent. up on that. So. And then perineal massage, there is research to support that it helps. So I'll post a couple um, excerpts from some articles for people that really want to read into some of the details. And if you have any questions, feel free to DM me and uh, we'll connect. I'll connect you with as much research as you want. Okay. Okay. Uh, <laughs> what positions are best to minimize tearing? So do you find that... Uh, one position is better than the other and does your hospital allow multiple positions so yes um we we do encourage women to um kind of uh, um use different p positions when they're in active labor uh that's particularly relevant for the women that are um low sorry she's seen my laptop oh, she's she funny. wants it and i know we have a lot of questions so we'll be done yes. soon layla yes and um we'll we'll convene on another topic on another day because this is really yeah, exciting. No, we're fine, we're okay. the, the amount of engagement and, and questions was incredible. Yeah, no, so, really good. Mm -hmm. um, now I've lost. Tell me again the question. I know. Oh, positions. To minimize yes, caring. position, yes. So we divide women kind of into the very low risk women who want to go to our birth centers uh, where they um, see only midwives, where they have kind of minimal intervention. Um, they don't have continuous monitoring. And in a birth center, you're really encouraged to use the different positions, use water for birth and that sort of thing. And so in those kind of low risk um, situations, if you don't need to be attached to a monitor, you, you don't have um, an epidural in situ, then giving birth in whatever position feels comfortable for you can be really helpful um it's it's difficult once somebody has an epidural obviously to to adopt different positions in labor so it it just depends on whether what, what happens for you in your labor does your hospital allow like if somebody wanted to be on their hospital bed on hands and knees or did, did they if if it was yeah safe, absolutely yeah was safe. and again okay. in those situations it's still helpful for the midwife to support you with the kind of a hands-on delivery uh to reduce the risk of tearing but you can go with whichever position feels comfortable for your body okay great and then does a v-back cause more risk of tearing um not specific. So VBAC is um, having a vaginal birth after a C-section. So kind of the vagina and the perineum, um, assuming last time nothing kind of nothing affected them, mm -hmm. then I wouldn't I wouldn't expect that somebody having a VBAC to be at any higher risk than any other primate. So anybody else going through their first vaginal birth. Good. Okay. Well, that is it for these questions that I have. I know that we probably didn't get to all the questions, but yeah. we will. We will either we'll do a um, a written response or mm -hmm. we'll do another live and we'll connect people with the answers and the information that you want. Yeah. Um, absolutely. Is there anything that you'd like to share with folks before we wrap up? I think that was quite a nice summary of, um, you know, why we do instrumentals, what types of instrumentals are out there, um, and kind of what situations we do episiotomies in. Uh, but if people have more questions, they're welcome to, um, yeah, to send them in. I think you've still got your stickers up. Yes, I do. Uh, so we can try and try and answer a few more questions that way. Yes. Okay, good. Well, thank you so much for joining me, Brooke. Thank you, Layla. I know it's lovely easy. to talk You've to you. have been working all day long. So thank you for working me into your schedule. And thank we'll do it again. You. All right, bye. Okay, take care. Bye-bye.